There were many kinds of molecules in the primordial soup. Some were attracted to water on one side and repelled by it on the other. This drove them together into a tiny enclosed spherical shell, like a soap bubble, which protected the interior. Within the bubble, the ancestors of DNA found a home and the first cell arose. It took hundreds of millions of years for tiny plants to evolve, giving off oxygen. But that branch didn't lead to us. Bacteria that could breathe oxygen took over a billion more years to evolve. From a naked nucleus, a cell developed with a nucleus inside. Some of these amoeba-like forms led eventually to plants. Others produced colonies with inside and outside cells performing different functions, becoming a polyp attached to the ocean floor, filtering food from the water and evolving little tentacles to direct food into a primitive mouth. This humble ancestor of ours also led to spiny-skinned, armored animals with internal organs, including our cousin, the starfish. But we don't come from starfish. About 550 million years ago, filter feeders evolved gill slits, which were more efficient at straining food particles from the water. One evolutionary branch led to acorn worms. Another led to a creature which swam freely in the larval stage, but as an adult was still firmly anchored to the ocean floor. Some became living hollow tubes, but others retained the larval forms throughout the life cycle and became free-swimming adults with something like a backbone. Our ancestors now, 500 million years ago, were jawless, filter-feeding fish, a little like lampreys. Gradually, those tiny fish evolved eyes and jaws. Fish then began to eat one another. If you could swim fast, you survived. If you had jaws to eat with, you could now use your gills to breathe the oxygen in the water. This is the way modern fish arose. During the summer, some swamps and lakes dried up, so some fish evolved a primitive lung to breathe air until the rains came. Their brains were getting bigger. If the rains didn't come, it was handy to be able to pull yourself along to the next swamp. That was a very important adaptation. first amphibians evolved, still with a fish-like tail. Amphibians, like fish, laid their eggs in water where they were easily eaten. But then a splendid new invention came along. The hard-shelled egg laid on the land where there were as yet no predators. Reptiles and turtles go back to those days. Many of the reptiles hatched on land never returned to the waters. Some became the dinosaurs. One line of dinosaurs developed feathers useful for short flights. Today, the only living descendants of the dinosaurs are the birds. The great dinosaurs evolved along another branch. Some were the largest flesh eaters ever to walk the land. But 65 million years ago, they all mysteriously perished. Meanwhile, the forerunners of the dinosaurs were also evolving in a different direction. Small, scurrying creatures with the young growing inside the mother's body. After the extinction of the dinosaurs, many different forms developed. The young were very immature at birth in the marsupials, the wombat for example, and in the mammals. The young had to be taught how to survive. The brain grew larger still. Something like a shrew was the ancestor of all the mammals. One line took to the trees, developing dexterity, stereo vision, larger brains, and a curiosity about their environment. Some became baboons, but that's not the line to us. Apes and humans have a recent common ancestor. Bone for bone, muscle for muscle, 
molecule for molecule, there are almost no important differences between apes and humans. Unlike the chimpanzee, our ancestors walked upright, freeing their hands to poke and fix an experiment. We got smarter. We began to talk. Many collateral branches of the human family became extinct in the last few million years. We, with our brains in our hands, are the survivors. There's an unbroken thread that stretches from those first cells to us. Let's look at it again, compressing four billion years of evolution into 40 seconds.